Hello and welcome everybody. I'm James Milan from ACMI and uh, we want to welcome you to this very special evening. I am looking at a number of audience members in our studio and four distinguished panelists who are here. All of us to talk about a situation which you may or may not be aware of. Um, I'm going to just explain it and, uh, and then we're going to have our panelists really dig down into it. So a couple of months ago, we received an email here at ACMI alerting us about some truly startling numbers. In Arlington, which is home to 19,000 households and thousands of school-aged children, of the 40 primary care providers operating in town, more than 70% of them were unable to accept new patients. And for those that are accepting new patients, the average wait time is several months. So, and this situation is just as bad or even worse in a number of other towns and cities in this area, including Watertown at 65% not accepting new patients and Woburn at a mind-blowing 89%. So this obviously got our attention and led to me being able to sit down with the man next to me, Dr. Wayne Altman, one of our panelists tonight, and we had a very sobering but enlightening 30-minute conversation about this crisis of access to primary care uh, in our area and, and well beyond. Um, so for anyone interested, you can find that interview on our website, acmi.tv, as part of our Talk of the Town series. It's very good. He's very good. Um, Wayne suggested at that time that we can do even more to inform residents in Arlington and beyond about the situation and about possible solutions. And from that came the idea that brings us together tonight. Our hope is that this public forum, which, we will, which will take the form of a pretty freewheeling conversation, we hope, uh, among our panelists, and will also include a Q&A with members of our studio audience, we hope that it will both inform and inspire our audience to take an active role in addressing the primary care crisis, even if that just means, you know, letting your, your legislators know that you support PC4U, which is the legislation intended to improve the situation that is currently wending its way through the State House and about which we will be talking in some detail. So I want to ask, first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our, our uh, panelists uh, as I ask you questions, if that's OK. Or, uh, so it won't, it won't be four introductions at once. I'm going to just start uh, by talking about Wayne Altman. So uh, Wayne is a professor at the Tufts University Medical School and chair of their family medicine department. In fact, he is, uh, I'm sorry, he is in fact the chair of their uh, family medicine department. He is also the co-author, I think, I think, I wrote this and I think so, of the legislation that we will be discussing at length. And perhaps most pertinent for tonight's discussion, uh, Wayne is a practicing primary care clinician here in Arlington. He is also the instigator of this public forum, and I'm looking forward to the combination of candor, urgency, and optimism he will likely bring to this discussion. So I'm going to ask you right away. Set the scene for us, Wayne. You, you walked into the studio and you laid it out quite clearly for our audience at that time. I'd like you just to do the same for the folks who are here and who are listening. Well, thank you so much, James. Thank you for inviting all of us here. It's an honor to be here. And um, we have a crisis, and uh, sometimes it's easier, easy to forget uh, what, what this crisis is. It's easy to look at numbers. Sometimes people get lost in numbers, they hear 70% here, 80% there. But if you just think about uh, yourself and your families uh, who have lost a primary care doctor, maybe they have retired, maybe they have moved away, uh, maybe they have left the profession because they're feeling burnt out uh, about the practicing of primary care, uh, it is very difficult right now to find a new primary care clinician. And many of you know friends and family who have tried to do this and have struggled mightily in, in order to do that. And uh, I met some folks. Uh, the, the challenge of finding a new primary care clinician is, is, uh, affects all socioeconomic classes. And I met some folks who were uh, pretty privileged, pretty well off, who were lamenting how difficult it was for them to find a new primary care clinician. And I looked at them and I said, but you found somebody, didn't you? And they said, yes, we did find someone. I said, I know exactly how you did, because you know somebody who knows somebody, and they reached out, and they did a favor for you, and they called up, and they asked a doctor to make an exception and take you on. And they said, that's exactly how we got our primary care uh, cl clinician, except not everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. 
and that's not a, a way to have a, a health care policy. It is most certainly not an equitable way to offer health care. And so uh, about five years ago, I reached out to Senator Cindy Friedman, who folks in Arlington uh, know, who's been our state senator in this community for, I believe, seven years now. Mm -hmm. And um, I started telling her about this crisis, and she interrupted me after five minutes, and she said, I get it. I agree with you. I understand this problem, and um, tell me how to fix it, and we'll do it, and we'll write the legislation. So in fact, I am not the co-author of this legislation. Senator Cindy Friedman is the author of this legislation, and she has been a champion of primary care uh, since uh, the start of her uh, term. Uh, as senator, and this this uh, this crisis is not just a crisis of access that we've talked about. It is a crisis of equity because there are people uh, uh, in our communities that have access to really high quality health care, and there are others who don't. And there are people who are getting really high quality health care, and there are others who are getting less good uh, quality health care. And there is an antidote to access. Uh, crisis. There's an antidote to this equity crisis and there's an antidote to the quality of care crisis. It turns out primary care has a triple superpower. When you increase primary care, you increase the health of a population, you increase the uh, equity that is delivered in health care to an overall population and you do all of that for a less overall cost. Imagine you get more for less. And in our infinite wisdom in the United States of America and the state of Massachusetts, we invest about six cents of every dollar into primary care. Every dollar of health care spent only six cents. In most other developed countries whose health care outcomes are far greater than ours, far better than ours, they invest about 15 cents of every dollar uh, into primary care, every health care dollar into primary care. So Senator Friedman uh, wrote this legislation that, uh, that we call Primary Care for You or PC for You. And this legislation doubles primary care investment to get it into that sweet spot of 12 to 15 percent of health care dollars invested in primary care. It incentivizes primary care uh, uh, practices to offer a much higher quality and standard of primary care with additional services such as mental health care practitioners embedded within the office collaborating with your primary care clinicians, community health workers, addiction treatment, group visits, medical scribes, social workers, case managers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we'll talk to you more about this legislation. I will, I will tell you this one other piece of this legislation. When a patient comes to a practice, a primary care practice, after this legislation is passed, there will be no co-pays and no deductibles for your primary care. Primary care will be free of charge. There will be no disincentives to seeking primary care. And I'll leave it there for now, James. All right, well, thank you very much for that introduction. And we will, you know, as promised, um, be digging down into that legislation a little bit more just a little bit later. I now want to invite one by one each of the rest of the panelists. I appreciate your guys' patience so far. And again, once we're done with, with me asking and you responding to these initial questions, we're going to kind of make sure, you know, ensure or hope that we can just get you guys talking to each other as well as the audience about your respective experiences, your perspectives, et cetera. But I'm going to start with uh, the uh, very um, distinguished woman right next to. <laughs> Uh, Wayne, and th that she is Carol, Dr. Carol Allen, excuse me. Uh, she is a board certified pediatrician who has been doing this work so long and has been involved <laughs> in so many different aspects from providing care to formulating policy that there is no way that I will be able to do her full justice in this introduction. <laughs> so I'll just say that and get ready for it because. There's a list. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Allen has been the Director of Pediatrics for Harvard Vanguard Med Medical Associates. She is a former president of the Massachusetts Medical Society. She has served on the board of the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission, and she has represented New England on the board of directors of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Oh, and oh yes, Carol was also a practicing pediatrician for many years. A heavy hitter, to be sure, I would say. So Carol, I hate to throw this 
<laughs> right at you, but I'm going to ask because, again, you've had years and years of experience in num in, on a number of different levels. The system is broken. Can you explain, you know, from whatever perspective you want, how has that happened? What, what are the manifestations of that broken system right. as you've seen them? Yes, so I would say our healthcare system is definitely broken. And in a nutshell, I see three areas as broken, access, costs, and outcomes. Um, access to care is, is terrible, as uh, Wayne has just pointed out, uh, and even more for some populations. Uh, costs uh, to individuals, families, and governments are exorbitant, and our health care outcomes are dismal. In the United States, we have sickness care, not health care. The primary care workforce is shrinking from retirements and from doctors quitting out of pure frustration. Medical students, with one exception, thank goodness, and <laughs> residents are not choosing primary care to go into primary care. And patients who cannot find a PCP or who are unable to get an appointment either postpone care or flood emergency departments. According to the Commonwealth Fund, the Kaiser Family Foundation, and others, the United States has the lowest life expectancy at birth, the highest death rates for avoidable or treatable conditions, the highest by far mater maternal and infant mortality, and among the highest suicide rates in the world. And all of this is worse for poor and black and brown communities. The United States has the highest rate of people with multiple chronic conditions and an obesity rate nearly twice the average of peer nations. Yet we spend almost 18% of our gross domestic product on health care. Out-of-pocket spending is rising and can lead families to either sacrifice for health care or postpone or avoid needed care. There is plenty of money in health care. It's just maldistributed. We pay for the wrong things, and we underfund those of value. Our fee-for-service system rewards widgets, procedures, and office visits over population health. We need to redirect funds from large hospital systems and pharmaceuticals and channel them to primary care, community services, behavioral health, and prevention. Dr. Asaf Bitan, a Boston health policy expert, gave a recent talk to, at, uh, to the Massachusetts Medical Society, and he, and he said, Primary care is the only part of the healthcare system in which investments routinely result in longer lives and more equity. In other words, primary care is the solution to costs and outcomes if there is access, as we think we'll talk about that. Um, yet the share of the total healthcare spend in primary care, as Wayne pointed out, is abysmally low, around five or six percent. The PC4U legislation addresses both the amount and the method of payment for primary care. And the other thing that is at a breaking point is trust. For over 37 years, I was privileged to care for children from birth to adulthood. It was an opportunity to build longitudinal, mutually uh, caring and trusting relationships. As primary care doctor for my patients, I served sort of as a quarterback or their navigator, and sometimes they felt like I was part of their family. It's heartbreaking to me that trust in medicine and in science is being eroded by the transactional nature of healthcare today. Through this legislation, uh, to invest in primary care, we're hoping to turn this around. Okay, I, thank you, I appreciate that very much. Um, before I move on to our next panelist, though, I did want to ask all of you, actually, um, uh, if you have any thoughts or any response to the question of why why is it that this is the situation? Why do we spend the money in the wrong places? Oh, that's a, it's a very simple answer, James. Um, our healthcare system is based on profit, not people. And when everything is based on profit, we get the system that we have. Right. And the, there's only one way to shift that emphasis of profit to people and communities, and that is through legislation. Any, any other comments or? No, it's, I mean, it has evolved as a 
sort of a conglomeration of things as opposed to uh, something being planned in advance, and mm -hmm. that's part of the problem too. And that's where the profit um, industry came, came in, really, opportunity. Right, it's just seems like the momentum is all in one direction and you have to really work hard uh, yeah, to, <laughs> to, to, to change that ocean liner's uh, kind of uh, trajectory. Right. Um, okay, moving, moving forward um, to our third panelist, Glavielinas uh, Cruz, uh, is, or she works as a behavioral health clinician at Lynn Community Health Center. Um, and as a bilingual and bicultural clinician, Dr. Cruz provides a broad variety of medical, behavioral, diagnostic, and therapeutic services to children and adults alike. And so Glavi stands clearly or, and squarely on the front lines of a particular branch of community health services. So we're grateful for the insights she will provide about how things look and feel out there. And that's what I want to ask you. How do things look and feel out there? Uh, especially because you deal with the conjunction of, you know, uh, health and also mental health. Absolutely. Uh, things are looking quite dire, <laughs> to be fully honest. So I, I'd also like to highlight that apart from working as a behavioral health clinician at Lane Community Health Center, I'm also a behavioral health clinician for the Integrated Center for Group Medical Visits, which is a practice um, spearheaded by Dr. Jeffrey Geller in the city of Lawrence. So I'm able to see uh, and, and gauge what the behavioral health needs are in, in both the Merrimack Valley and also um, the North Shore area and in, in working in Lynn. Um, as, as we have heard from our two other panelists here, there is a high and dire need when it comes to primary care. And, and you heard Dr. Altman talk about the numbers. They're staggering. And when it comes to behavioral health care, you probably don't even want to know what those look like, right? In order to be able to secure mental health services for patients has been very dire. I don't know how many people here in the audience today has ever tried to secure behavioral health services for themselves or a family member or friends. But as you know, it's, it's working a very complex system that it seems only gets more complex as, as we progress. Um, as a behavioral health clinician myself, I do see the 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 power that this legislation will bring and for many reasons. So traditional primary care, I consider that to be healthcare 1.0. What does healthcare 1.0 mean, right? You, you have an ailment, you go visit your primary care physician, uh, you walk out with a script or with a follow-up medical appointment, right? That is what traditionally healthcare looked like then. Happy to say that we are, in my opinion, in healthcare 2.0, where you go in to visit your primary care phys physician, they will take care of your medical ailments. And in addition to that, you might say, well, doc, you know what? I also have some sleep hygiene needs, or I'm also feeling a little bit anxious and depressed, right? Healthcare 2.0, in my mind, looks like this. That physician will say, okay, uh, Susie or Johnny, you know, I, 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 I can take care of your medical needs, but I also have colleagues that can best answer other needs. I I have behavioral health clinicians and here is a referral here is a place you can go to to get your answers that is healthcare 2.0 to me what this legislation to me really brings is healthcare 3.0 and i think that's the vision that we need to really consider and think where behavioral health clinicians like myself and my colleagues are right embedded and co-located with the primary care physicians with the nurses, with the nurse practitioners. So you are working hand in hand with community health workers, with clinical social workers, with psychologists. And that is the, the vision for healthcare because mental health and behavioral health is healthcare. We should not be separating those two because as we know, the body and the mind should, are not two separate entities. You can't have, cannot have one thing without the other. And I think for many, many years in the healthcare field, we've been working in silos. And I think it's it's time to end th those silos. As a, as a behavioral health clinician, I, I you know, it would be remiss if I don't talk about Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which basically I'm sure many of you have seen the triangle um, hierarchy of needs and at the very bottom and at the very base are your basic necessities. What does that look like? Food, shelter, and safety. If those are not met, it's really hard to climb up the rung. Um, and I think being able to incorporate behavioral health services with your primary care physicians embedded not only in the same building, right across the hall, right next to you, uh, it's a one-stop one shop. And it will make you know medical care uh, integrated with behavioral care, uh, behavioral health care, be a well-rounded service that we can provide uh, to patients. So we're moving away from profit to people uh, to quality. 
and that's what we need. Uh, so behavioral health, uh, of course, I'm biased when I say this. Uh, it's, a, it's a necessity. It's a must. It's not an option. It's not a privilege. It's a requirement. And I think behavioral health care needs to be embedded in all of our medical practices, whether community-based or private-based as well. Okay, I just want to repeat my invitation to all of the panelists, including Aaron, who we haven't heard from yet, but we, we are about to. But if you have any reactions to what Glavi just said, if you want to, again, turn this more into a conversation, please do. I love I, everything that Glavi just said. I do too. But I'm just really happy about, the, put, about putting the head back on the body. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, we've had separate payment systems for um, medical care versus uh, behavioral health care or mental health care. And that's been part of the problem, I think. Um, and there's a huge difference between, as you talked about, um, health care 2.0 and 3.0, versions 2.0 and 3.0. There's a big difference between giving, saying, here's a referral to, to this, uh, to a behavioral health. First of all, good luck getting an, finding one and getting an appointment. Uh, and that applies to both patients and doctors. When I had a private practice in Arlington trying to find a behavioral health person for my patients was not easy. Um, versus uh, the, what we call the warm handshake. Here, here's, and, and the, the um, both the, the, the data on keeping appointments, not, you know, not missing appointments is, uh, is very impressive. But also, just um, it's, it, it is another access issue, and um, I'm so glad Absolutely. you're doing it. <laughs> and the, the, the warm handoff that you talk about really destigmatizes de mental health, and that's, a, that's, right. that's huge. We, we really right. need to normalize mental health the same way that you go to the, your primary care physician for an ailment, a broken ankle, um, the, the same way right. we need to facilitate right. that for patients who may be feeling anxious or depressed. Uh, so, absolutely, absolutely. And by warm hand up, what you're referring to is just that idea the that person, one yeah, one sure. one person you trust I'm, will connect you with another person. Introduce you to this person right here. You literally <laughs> walk them down the hall. Literally walking down the hall. Absolutely. Or, Here's my colleague. You're not leaving the building until you've made the connection. You may not be, have time for the whole appointment, but at least you've made the connection and. You're, the likelihood of following through is much greater. And after the patient gets up off the floor from fainting <laughs> at the access to mental health care that they never imagined to be true, uh, it really works quite well. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and, you know, all of us are patients, right? And, and we all have formed meaningful uh, relationships with our primary care physicians and how powerful it is that the, the person that you have trusted with your health can say, you know what? I have a colleague next door to me. Let me take you to this colleague. Let me take you to Dr. Cruz, to, to whomever uh, other behavioral health clinician, and, and they will speak with you. So that's powerful. Speaks volumes. All right. Thank you very much. And finally, certainly, certainly not last, or last but not least, for sure, uh, and you'll see, you, everybody will see why sh very shortly. We really appreciate uh, both the presence and the participation of Aaron Moose, who is a fourth year uh, student at Tufts Medical School, uh, who has chosen very much against the prevailing tide, as was alluded to before, <laughs> to do her upcoming residency in the field of, I think it's family medicine, is that it right? Is, yeah. um, so she has taken a lead role in a number of school, regional, and national organizations and initiatives that address such topics as curriculum development, primary care policy in Massachusetts, and sustainability. And by virtue of her relative youth and certainly her commitment to the field, Erin certainly gives us more reasons to be optimistic that this crisis can be addressed effectively. That's what we're hoping to add another little tiny step to today. So Erin, let me just ask you, you know, you're the only person here, frankly, who can speak to this particular thing. Uh, we have heard about early retirements and just the fact that it, part of the difficulty with access is simply not enough clinicians for the people who need access. Um, you are right there, fourth year, making your decisions, et cetera. You know that you are that rare person among your, your cohort doing that. So what made you, what makes you do it? Uh, and, uh, and what do you think is going on with everybody else? Yes. Um, so I can tell you that coming into medical school, I was hoping to like primary care. 
and during high school in my local paper, which that was somehow 10 years ago, so long-standing crisis, there was an advertisement for a local community and they were offering their health center space rented for $1 a month because they were so desperate mm -hmm. for any practitioner to come and take care of this community. Wow. So that's something I've been thinking about since high school, wanting to fill this need. And then as many people spoke to coming to Boston, I was able to get on a wait list for a primary care doctor, but it took me six months as someone who is theoretically literate in, in healthcare and navigating the system, it still was over a six month wait for me to get a primary care doctor here. So I definitely have felt this need and was hoping it was something that I would still desire to fill <laughs> after going through medical school. So I was hoping to wanna choose it and then some of the things that have made me still choose to pursue family medicine include, um, well, I think I just deeply believe in the in preventative medicine, and I'll let you know that my favorite rotation of third year was actually surgery. Um, it was really fun to have something to do and little tasks with your hands, but what I loved the most about surgery was when the patients would come in for a consultation about maybe needing their leg amputated. It felt like such an opportunity to discuss, like, now, now's the time to quit smoking. Now's the time to get your diabetes in check. Like, now's the time to take control of your health and do the preventative me measures to avoid surgery. And it turns out that's not what makes a good surgeon. <laughs> so that is actually family medicine. That is the field that encourages these um, preventative tasks. And so then I went on to my family medicine rotation and I found myself in a room with many different doctors who had found their niche in family medicine. I think it's a field that allows you to have a personality and follow your passions and take care of patients in a way that's meaningful for you and them. So I was with this practitioner who has provided this doctor who loves obstetrics. So she does all the prenatal visits, delivers her own patients, and then follows the babies through the well child checks. And she was having this visit that was supposed to be a back-to-back -back postpartum visit and a well child check for this two-week-old baby but the dad came too, and dad had a question about his blood pressure and while we're all in there they get a call from school and the older sister has pink eye and this <laughs> this doctor treated truly the whole family um in this 35 minute visit um and it was just really special the connection the that she was part of the family as dr allen said um the connection she was able to make so it's something i was really excited to see her be so excited about and something i hope to carry forth but as many people also alluded, I had many peers to poll about why they are not choosing family medicine and a couple themes emerged and one of them is that um, with so many providers not taking new patients, they're already seeing a lot of patients and when someone knows someone who knows someone who gets you in, that means that this really short 15 minute visit is now double booked. So these providers are working really hard. There's never enough time for the person in front of them to have everything they need addressed at that visit. So I think as a student, it feels exhausting, chaotic, rushed and kind of incomplete at times mm -hmm. by nature of the pressures that primary care is facing. Um, a couple students said that primary care and the inbox that they were watching their preceptors manage made uh, continuity with patients seem undesirable. Just this constant influx of contact and expectation um, that even on vacation, there's a physician in the clinic I'm at now going on vacation for August, but she's taking her inbox with her. And, and that's honestly, truly maybe half a vacation at best. Um, so I think some students didn't like that. And then med school is really expensive um, in many ways. So financially, primary care compensates a lot of ranges, but like roughly half as much as some specialties. And not only is, is med school financially expensive, but it also takes truly blood, sweat, and tears, all three, and just a lot of sacrifice and uh, like a lot of your youth. And so I think money is also kind of a representation of value and the value that our society is placing on primary care and when students see this choice of being in a really well resourced orthopedic wing with full staff and a high salary it's not just the salary but it's like the perceived value that society and and the resources and all that respect and such that follows as well so i think primary care is definitely due for a revamp so this is a really important bill um, thank you so much for that, because um, there was both optimism and very much realism kind of permeating the, your entire testimony there. Um, and uh, what I want to do, we're going to take a break shortly before we come back and then discuss the legislation and go to, to questions and answers from the audience. But before we do that, I did want to address one thing that Aaron was just saying and ask you, Wayne, to follow up and, and invite everybody else, of course. 
Um, that thing that Erin was just saying about one of uh, the doctors that she knows taking her inbox with her, uh, that reminds me of something you, you, you told uh, me about in terms of just what that day looks like, what your day looks like, or what a PCP's day looks like in terms of how much of it is you're getting your comp the compensation you deserve and how much of it is beyond that. So just if you can speak to that a little bit. Well, not everybody knows wh what an inbox is, uh, and, and, and uh, it, it's, it's quite glorious, isn't it? Um, uh, James, um, you asked about the typical day of a PCP, so I, I saw patients all day today. Um, I don't do those 15-minute visits that most people do that Aaron referenced uh, because I just can't. Uh, I do 30-minute visits, so I saw about 15 folks today and had a really great time seeing them. And, um, uh, and at the end of the day, um, you have a list of tasks in what is called your inbox. Uh, you have a number of lab results that uh, need to be addressed. You have a, a number of messages from patients who have questions about their, their health and their well-being uh, to address. And um, in our current system, that work is not paid for. So I jokingly call that my volunteer time. And, um, and that sometimes can take one, two, three, four hours on any given day to address that inbox. A lot of people call it pajama time. I was going to say pajama time. If you take it home and you do it late at night after you put the kids to bed and all of that, you know, you, you still have to manage your family and your home life. And, that, and that's quite typical, isn't it, Carol? Absolutely. And so um, you can imagine how people would feel resentful about that. And people don't feel resentful about the patients and the questions they're asking because they're important questions and the care is important. People feel resentful about the system that requires them to spend pajama time finishing their work. And what we're trying to do is fix the job so that this system uh, supports patients provides them the access they deserve, the quality of care they deserve, the equity they deserve, and it, it uh, organizes it in a way that primary care clinicians can thrive in instead of feel burnt out in. You know, I, I, uh, I'll just say I feel <laughs> uh, it, it's really been interesting to get this education about what the actual life of a primary care physician is like on a day-to-day -day basis because I spent uh, 23 years as a high school teacher myself, and um, after putting the kids to bed and all that other stuff, I would tackle my homework for the three hours or so that it took. And I thought, man, you know, teachers have it tough. And, you know, and I would have thought at that time, oh, a primary care physician, they're done for the day, boom, they're done. I guess not, huh? I guess not. Um, so, yeah, that is that is quite a wear uh, and tear and I just kind want of to aspect. Add something to something Aaron was talking about. A, um, not, the average medical student comes out of medical school with somewhere between two and three hundred thousand dollars in debt. So, not, you know, so talk about, you know, wanting to start your family, wanting to buy a house, wanting to move your life along, and, and you're just saddled with this debt. And of course, you're going to choose. A specialty that at least <laughs> gives you some time and some money uh, and, and that's what we have to fix so many pressures in that way yeah right. all right we are going to take a short break um, especially it's very hot in here you don't know that out there but we all know that here um, so we're gonna take a little break and when we come back we will as I said uh, tackle this legislation a little bit more in detail and then open things to questions from our very patient uh, very very uh, grace gracious audience so we'll, we'll be back in just a minute. And we are back. Uh, welcome, I'm James Milan, and um, I will not worry about introducing everybody else to each other because we're all some kind of family now. <laughs> um, all right, I would like to start, uh, we're gonna move as promised to the legislation PC for you, primary care for you is the, is the title. Uh, we wanna talk about this. Uh, what I'm interested in uh, is the fact that you guys have brought up in a very compelling way a lot of the problems, a lot of the, the issues that make this a crisis, whether it is access, 
or equity or uh, the, the, the plight of students considering uh, this as a field, uh, et cetera. And this legislation is all we have right now on the table on the solutions side. And so I would imagine that there are things in the legislation that are meant to address all of those kinds of issues. I'd like to start uh, with, the, uh, with what Aaron was talking about. Uh, what is there in the legislation? You know, she, again, made a really compelling case for uh, the fact that she's a hero for, do, for choosing to do this despite the obstacles in her way, but that for most people, they are choosing something else. So is there something in the legislation that's going to deal with what I would call the pipeline problem? You know, make sure we get more people able to come into this field. There damn well better be. <laughs> um, it, it, because without that, without, if we don't solve that, we've got nothing. Um, and uh, just one quick word before we get to that, James. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the name of this legislation. It is also known as S.750, Senate Bill 750. Good Some point. folks might want to look that up or, 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 or Google that to find the legislation. They also can go to the website, uh, pc4u.org, uh, with the number 4, pc number 4you.org, uh, and can learn more about the legislation. So I've been teaching at Tufts Medical School for... Uh, almost 25 years now, and uh, Carol and I were just talking off camera about how amazing the medical students are. And I have had the, the privilege and pleasure of uh, working with and teaching uh, thousands of medical students over this last quarter century. And um, this problem that Erin so beautifully described is a systems problem. And so when you have a systems problem, you need a solution that is based on systems. And um, this problem with medical students, this is really the inspiration behind and the motivation behind uh, creating this legislation when we started. Uh, because like I said, that is at the core. The, without a solution here, we've got nothing. And um, I spoke to a major leader of primary care and a major hospital system in Massachusetts. And he told me a story about how he sent out an email to uh, several hundred primary care clinicians at his shop and said, everybody's getting a raise. Congratulations. Everyone's going to get a significant raise. And he was kind of shocked because uh, he received many emails within 24 hours stating, no thanks. I don't need your raise. Just drop my hours the commensurate amount for the amount of money that you were about to give me because I am exhausted and I just need to be sane and I need some sleep. And so just drop my hours and that'll be fine. And what he concluded, what he told me is, current practicing primary, clinician, primary care clinicians don't need the money, they need the sanity. They need to fix the job from a systems point of view. Uh, but medical students need two things. If medical students are gonna choose primary care as a career, they need us to fix the job and they need to fix the pay. And uh, we're not talking, you know, when we, when we double primary care investment, this is not shorthand for giving a bunch of primary care docs a big raise, mm -hmm. all right? Nobody is crying because primary care clinicians aren't making enough money uh, in the public. I get that, okay? But you need to address the salary differences between primary care and specialty because when Aaron talked about a roughly difference of double in salary, if you're talking about a average salary of primary care around $250,000 compared to a specialist salary of $500,000 over a 40 year career, that's a difference of $10 million. And a lot of times legislators think that loan repayment programs where they bribe medical students to choose primary care if they repay some or all of their loans will solve the problem, and it doesn't. The, the data is very clear that does not solve the problem. It turns out medical students are smart, they know math, and they know that $10 million is more than repaying $250,000 of loans. So um, this legislation fixes the job and fixes the pay, and that's the only thing that will solve this problem, James. Okay, it, like, can you tell us some about how it does that? Absolutely. So we talked about earlier about doubling primary care investment, okay? And so, uh, and what we're also doing 
is um, shifting uh, the way we pay primary care clinicians from a fee-for-service model to what we call a prospective monthly payment. And I want to explain that a little bit more. I know uh, Hester had a question. Absolutely. I see, I see what, uh, what quandary I put you in there, Wayne. <laughs> yes, we are going to proceed to Hester's question now, which will push the ball just a little bit further down the field here. Let's do that. Yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about how the legislation changes reimbursement so that primary care doctors get paid for all the time that they're spending on their inboxes in their pajamas. Right, so pajama time and volunteer time becomes part of the job and is no longer feeling, you're not feeling resentful for the pajama time or the volunteer time, right? And that's when you, fee for service, I think Carol, you were talking about widgets, yeah. right? And, and in our current fee for service system, right, uh, as a primary care clinician, we are motivated financially to bring you into the office to have a visit. Now, how many times have people had a question for their PCP, for their primary care doc, that honestly needed a two-minute phone call? I just have a quick question. I need your expertise to answer this question. Do you seriously need me to wait on hold for 10 minutes, make an appointment, take a half day off of work that I may or may not get paid on, depending on what kind of job I have, wait in your waiting room for 30 minutes, and then uh, wait in the exam room for another 15 minutes for the doctor to finally get there uh, and answer this two-minute question. You could have just picked up the phone and called me, but if I don't get paid to pick up the phone or, or, or email back to answer your question, all the incentives are misaligned. But he, he's not saying to get paid you know, each uh, time there's an email or each time there's a phone call. He's talking about your office gets enough money that you can do these things and it's just part of it's part of how things come together and it's something we haven't talked about is the the huge amount of money that is spent on billing because um, when there's fee for service there are codes something called CPT codes and every service that's provided whether it's a vaccine whether it's a visit whether it's a procedure has a code and and then people uh, and then you have to you have to write your note in a certain way, you have to code that visit properly to get paid for that. And that requires an infrastructure of some practices hire a full-time person or more to just do billing. If we didn't have to do that, if you just got a monthly influx, um, you, you could you know, redirect those funds to where they matter. Absolutely, and can I also add the huge yeah. discrepancies in I ICD and CPT codes with behavioral health, right. it's astronomical. Right. as well right. um, to the point that it's really hard for behavioral health clinicians to really provide the appropriate level of care because the level of um, reimbursement rates for behavioral health clinicians and for behavioral uh, health visits again it's looking quite dire it's shameful it is it's it absolutely shameful is. which yeah. is why many behavioral yeah. health clinicians don't take insurance do not take insurance and take cash pay only so that they can make a reasonable and respectful living for the training they have and the work that they do. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So can I, I'm sorry, I just want to, want to, I want to ask a clarifying cl question to you, Glavi. Do you mean that basically if you have somebody in front of you and you want to be able to provide them with certain uh, services, what you are going to be, the way that you are going to be recompensed for those is uh, like the bill looks big to the patient? Or, or to the insurance company initially or whatever, but what ends up coming to you is very is very absolutely. little. Is that what yes, you mean? Yes, absolutely. And then the all the hurdles that insurance companies make clinicians uh, go through is also astronomical. So to Dr. Altman's point, a lot of behavioral health clinicians end up choosing private pay or end up going into private pay practice uh, in order to avoid all these uh, like red tape and hurdles and, and lack of reimbursement rates. Mm -hmm. So if we come back to Hester's question, okay, <laughs> right? So you have this primitive fee-for-service system that uh, has completely misaligned incentives that hurt the doctor and the patient, okay? That would be shifted to a prospective monthly payment, okay? So if you take the entire revenue that a practice receives and divide it by the number of months and the number of patients, it might add up to, I'll give you an example, $30 per patient per month. You're not paid per patient per month, 
but that's about the amount of money. What this legislation does is says, oh, you were getting about 30, now you get 60. But instead of having to jump through 100 hoops that Carol was describing, <laughs> right. okay, you don't have to jump through any of those hoops. You just get the $60 per patient per month. And you don't have to bill hundreds of bills. You have 1,000 patients, you bill for $60,000 for that month. And you just get the money. And you'll be expected to offer advanced services, behavioral health, clinicians embedded in your office where you can walk down the hall. And you are now able to afford those services by this increased investment in primary care. So now the services will be enhanced and now I don't have to see 20, 30 patients in a day and try and get pressure to have these 15 minute visits and crank out as many people as I can. Now for the 10 of those people I can make a quick phone call and answer their question. I can do a quick video visit with you. I can text you Oftentimes, it would be as simple as a quick response on text to answer your questions. So it allows, I can carve out a bunch of time during my work day, not during pajama time, <laughs> to do that work. And because now it's all paid for. My job is now to care for my patients. It's, my job is now to prevent illness and to keep people well. I know Suzanne earlier in our audience was asking, how do you get paid to keep people well? This is how you get paid to keep people well, when you shift the modality of payment that incentivizes keeping people healthy. Because another aspect of this legislation will measure the quality of care that you are delivering. And part of that quality will be the patient's report of their experience with the clinicians. Some people get nervous. Ooh, you've gotten paid already. You're getting your $60 per patient per month. You're going golfing every Wednesday. You're taking early afternoons on Fridays. You already got paid. But if you are getting evaluated based on the quality of care you're giving, based on your patient's experience, yeah, you can't do that, right? You have to deliver high quality care um, in order to get that double uh, investment in primary care. And you have to deliver those additional services to get that double investment in primary care. It's not a no strings attached, here's the money. All right, very good. That actually uh, also reminds me of a question that another audience member had er earlier. Uh, and Elena, I want to invite you to ask your question. My question is, uh, Dr. Alman, uh, how is primary care for you, uh, how is that going to be funded? Well, that matters a lot, Elena, doesn't it, right? If, you, if we don't know how the money's going to move, then nothing can happen. And so really your question is a critical question. And this legislation establishes a primary care trust uh, that is run by the state government that collects money from the health insurance companies so that the trust is now in charge of the payment model. It removes that responsibility from the insurance companies. And um, if you think about insurance, what is the point of insurance? We've all learned our entire lives. Insurance is to help protect us against catastrophic and unexpected events. Primary care is neither catastrophic nor unexpected, right? So insurance really doesn't belong with primary care. It belongs with many other aspects of health care. It's perfectly appropriate, but it doesn't really fit with primary care. And so this trust would collect the money from the payers and deliver it to the practices so that patients can get these advanced primary care services. Uh, okay, uh, that, that actually um, gets me to uh, a question that I had, which is, um, okay, does that mean, the way that you've just said that, that would make me think, oh, well then the insurance company should see what's good in this for them. Yes. Like <laughs> how, this, how this legislation is gonna work for them. And something tells me they're not going to. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate the delicacy of this next, of your needing to respond to the next, this next question, but, you know, who are the problems here that we are, you know, are going, that we can predict are going to be lined up on the other side of this and what to do about it? Well, there's no problems here, James. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I will say to you that we have had a number of conversations with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts 
and with the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans and their CEO, Laura Pellegrini. And both of those groups have been incredibly supportive of this legislation and the concepts in this legislation. They would be the first to say that they wholeheartedly support doubling primary care investment in Massachusetts. They would be the first to say that shifting from fee-for-service to a prospective monthly payment, they are 110% in favor of that. They also have concerns about the primary care trust because it's different than anything that they've ever done before. It shifts the locus of control from right. insurance companies to a primary care trust for administering primary care and the payment for primary care. And they're uncomfortable with that. And that's okay, because this is the way it needs to happen to really make this model move forward. Yeah, one of the aspects of this legislation is accountability for what I call funds flow. So, because how do you ensure that if you have a, 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 a health system of some sort that employs primary care physicians, how do you uh, assure that that money actually gets to the practice level? And that's something we're very concerned about, um, but uh, the legislation addresses that in some ways. Um, we're still trying to work out some of the details, I think, because it's such an important issue, and tra transparency of funds flow is, it's very important to Senator Friedman, I know, um, to make sure that we account for that. In this is like wonky policy stuff, right? Yeah. And a lot of Sorry. people don't understand this. A, lo <laughs> a, a lot of physicians, most physicians don't right. even understand this, but a, a lot of the money flows from the insurance companies to large, large. health systems. More than two-thirds of primary care clinicians are employed by major health systems in Massachusetts. Um, and so the money goes to these health systems and it goes into this black box that nobody can see exactly what's happening to the money. And some of that money flows into primary care for the patients in those practices. And a lot of it flows sideways into those health systems, mm -hmm. sometimes for new MRI machines or transplant surgeons or other more or, lucrative. Right, or even they're telling you how, what to do when in fact at the practice level is what you really know, you know what your practice needs, you know what your patients need. And um, for somebody, you know, to be telling you how to manage that, and take and using their money <laughs> to make to make it happen, it, it you know doesn't um, improve primary care necessarily. So, it seems like a, a you know you've got the the issue of a lack of expertise on their part, you know, compared right. to what you know about your patients, right. but also that they're motivated by different things, different right. considerations, right? Right. Now, James, you you were suggesting that shouldn't the insurance companies see that this will be in their benefit, right? We actually did a simulation with a national healthcare consultant organization that showed that this legislation would actually pay for itself within four years. And it would actually, after four years, would start to save the Commonwealth money, would save everyone in the Commonwealth money. But in the first four years, who pays for it? Right, that was another question from our, from our audience. And uh, the way we've just described it, it's the health insurance companies paying for the whole thing. They just double it and they pay into the trust. And that's actually not appropriate and not fair to the health insurance companies. Sure, they will benefit and they should invest some of the resources into this. But our major health systems that have a lot of resources in the Commonwealth also would benefit from primary care investment and should invest into this uh, primary care for you legislation. The pharmaceutical industry is making a lot of money and would benefit from a robust <laughs> primary care system and should also invest into this legislation. And when you have everybody with a little bit of skin in the game, then each organization or each entity really only has to take a very small, pretty insignificant haircut in order to generate that, that uh, investment that pays in the first four years and then starts to reap big dividends after those four years. Um, a compelling case, I would say. Um, uh, let me ask uh, Glavi and, and Aaron whether you have, from your respective perspectives, and by that I mean, Glavi, <laughs> you're doing this work every day, uh, on, as, I, as I alluded to before, the front lines, and, and Aaron, you are looking at a <laughs> career starting in front of you in the next, in the next few years. Um, what is your reaction to hearing about or to knowing what you know about this legislation? How will it affect your current work, your work to be, 
Um, Absolutely. So I, I am patient facing. Um, no, no secret there. And I, I can see anywhere from 30 to 50 patients a week. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and this healthcare will certainly move our, our current picture of healthcare, which is very reactive, into being something proactive, which, which we have alluded to earlier today. And in doing that, by lowering um, our patient caseload, is, if you will, we can create a more robust team of clinicians that we work alongside with. Um, and that will definitely help us, but ultimately it helps the patient because we're able to offer an array of different services and, and specialty services, like um, uh, I believe James was saying, um, which ultimately helps the patient. And when we offer all these different services to patients, guess what? The cost of healthcare for the patient actually decreases. It absolutely decreases. So if we think about it that way, it's very cost effective. We're providing quality care to patients and your clinicians will be happy mm -hmm. <laughs> and content. I think it's a no-brainer. That's a pretty good summary. <laughs> yeah, 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 patients certainly seem like they'll be healthier too, you know, so Most therefore definitely. needing le less of the services. Yeah, yes. and Erin. Yeah, I believe in primary preventive care and, and that anecdote I shared earlier where the whole family came in and everybody got treated, only half of those were patients or billed for, and so I think it'll just create this sentiment of, of more wholeheartedly caring for everyone that needs it, whether they're in your office or across the text message, um, and happier clinicians, happy, happier patients, healthier system. I really think this is the future. And after you're done with your residency, you're going to have to choose what kind of practice you enter. And I think, you know, if, if practices like, like Wayne's are able to function in, in well, that would be an appeal, appealing <laughs> place to go, as opposed to, you know, one of the larger systems that uh, it may offer more money, but has a lot of other rules in it that um, are not so much fun to work under. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Great. We have just a short while left and a couple of questions from our audience. So, okay. Howard, would you like to ask? Uh, can you, you just sure. stand up for a sec? Sure. And ask. Mm -hmm. There you go. So, uh, are there other states in, in the uh, United States that have a system like this? And if so, how, how is it working? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Uh, this, um, so, so the answer is yes and no, Howard. Um, there are about 20 states that have, are at somewhere in the process of enacting primary care legislation, promoting doubling of primary care investment. But the idea of doubling primary care investment, shifting fee for service to a monthly prospective payment, and establishing a primary care trust has not been proposed in any state. However, we have been in conversation, Carol, uh, Carol is part of a team that we have of about 20 folks that have been working on this legislation for five and a half years. And um, we have been talking to a number of states where that feel like if this can pass in Massachusetts, this becomes a national model in the same way uh, that so-called Romney care from 15 years ago passed and became a national model with so-called Obamacare. I will add, uh, James, from the earlier discussion, that in this legislation, some I, I know people are watching this and going, well, I guess our taxes are going up because this is super expensive and so we must be paying, this is tax Massachusetts, we're gonna be paying for it. <laughs> this legislation is budget neutral, not one dollar is being asked for from the state of Massachusetts. So I won't pay any more for my health insurance premium. Correct. Okay. And there's an opportunity after pay four years for, for you to pay, pay less. less. Yeah. Uh, more for less. Well, there is no free lunch, so how did this all happen? <laughs> right, so we talked about it. We, we're asking large entities to make small investments uh, from their large coffers uh, in primary care that will benefit all of us and will benefit them. And, and we're saving money. The, the, when you give the care um, up front, when you are able to prevent a serious illness by seeing a patient, uh, or even prevent an emergency room visit by seeing a patient, you're saving money in the healthcare system overall, and ultimately that is the goal. Um, the, and, and that's when Wayne talks about four years paying for itself. It's because primary care saves money, as Dr. Bitten said to the medical society. Uh, are, are there any losers in this? I don't see any losers in this. Well, maybe some yeah, for-profit um, places. Oh, no, that's, that's a good point. Entities who manage the money now, right? Who yeah, you said sometimes <laughs> siphon it off for other things. 
won't they have less control over larger sums of money? I can see them as being concerned about losing a potential stream of income. So we talked about the primary care superpower and how it generates better health and equity at a lower cost. So how does it do that? The secret sauce of primary care is relationship-based care. Trust, trust. Relationship and trust. Carol started by talking about this. And so perhaps some of the losers are the people, the for-profit entities that are interested in uh, taking primary care and shifting it to a non-relationship-based transactional model. Okay. So uh, those models, they keep coming and then they go. And they come and then they go because they're not working. It's not what people want. People want the relationship. They want the trust. Yeah, so. And so, you know, I was in an emergency department, a local, reputable, high-quality emergency department six months ago with a family member. And I saw 85 people in the emergency department waiting room and told it was going to be a 10-hour wait. And I knew that at least half, probably three quarters of them, could have been seen in a primary care setting if there was primary care bandwidth to see them. And the emergency room had beds in the hallways. And I know that the people who are watching this have experienced this firsthand and know exactly what we're talking about. And the hospitals are struggling to find staffing to handle this overcapacity. So when you don't have 85 people waiting in an emergency department waiting room, um, everybody wins. All right, let's just, we are, we are out of time. Uh, just like that, right? It, 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 no surprise. Um, let us remind uh, the audience one last time of how they can get the answers that they may, to the questions they may still have uh, about this legislation. The, the, the website for the legislation is? So the website for the legislation is PC, the number four, u.org. And uh, we are in That's a legislative. Y-O-U, right? Y-O-U. That's right. And we are in a legislative session that ends on July 31st. And Senator Cindy Friedman is working very hard to, uh, at least in this session, get a foundation moving forward. So, so um, keep your eyes and ears out for the, the Senate health care bill that is going to be put forth in the next week or so uh, that will contain large components of pc for you uh, And then in the next legislation session that begins in January, um, we hope to pass pc for you uh, in full force in uh, 2025. And now it's S750, you said, right? Correct. Yeah. So uh, the other name for the bill. Okay. I want to thank, first of all, our studio audience who, again, uh, have, held, have put up with some pretty uh, warm lights and other conditions here and stayed attentive throughout. And, of course, I want to thank our uh, ex absolutely excellent panel, um, Aaron Moose, and Glavi Cruz, oh, Moose and Cruz, that's very <laughs> nice at the end of the line there. And Carol Allen and Wayne Altman, doctors all. Uh, and uh, I'm, my name is James Milan. This has been really, again, another, just like my conversation with Wayne about this earlier, sobering and highly enlightening and hopeful. So uh, with that as the last word, I want to thank everybody who has participated and also you out there for being with us for this. Uh, we will see you next time. Thank you, James. <laughs>